Someone tell that to China, though. They're not steering clear. They're hurtling towards trouble. Let me show you what happened in the Taiwan Strait. U.S. and Canadian navies were holding a joint drill. It's rare, but not unheard of. China, though, decided to spoil their party. A PLA warship cut in front of the U.S. destroyer. As you can see it in these pictures. The Chinese ship dashes in front of the American one. And between them, just 137 meters. That's a very risky maneuver. We're talking about lethal ships here. Even the slightest miscalculation could have been disastrous. So what was China trying to do? Clearly send a message. We saw a similar incident involving fighter jets. A Chinese plane came within 400 feet of a U.S. spy aircraft. Days later, this happens, a near collision between warships. It shows that China is becoming more brazen. They feel confident enough to buzz U.S. fighter jets or to cut across U.S. warships. China's defense minister has defended his navy at the Shangri-La talks. He says, if you want to avoid such incidents, stay away from Taiwan. To truly avoid these incidents, apart from making rules that we have to do as a last resort, the best way is for the countries, especially the naval vessels and fighter jets of countries, not to take closing actions around other countries' territorial sea and airspace. What's the point of going there? What does it have to do directly with your interests? To put it in our way, mind your own business and take good care of your own people, naval vessels and jets. The big picture here is scary. China and the U.S. are the largest militaries in the world. You don't want their warships colliding, certainly not in the Taiwan Strait, but China's intention is quite clear. They're trying to map out America's resolve to see how far they can push Joe Biden. And what's the assessment? Washington clearly wants to engage with Beijing, maybe not to reset ties, but at least to avoid mishaps. We saw an example of that in Singapore. The U.S. sought a meeting with China's defense minister, Li shang Fu. Guess what? He refused. Li says the U.S. must first show sincerity. Listen to this. China has been seeking to build a new type of major country relationship with the U.S., but it requires the U.S. side to show sincerity, match its words with deeds, and take concrete actions to meet China halfway so as to push forward the stabilization of bilateral relations between the two countries and militaries. As always, China says one thing but does another. The PLA has continuously harassed navies in the South China Sea. Such operations have become more frequent recently, but the U.S. faces a dilemma here. If they keep ignoring Chinese provocations, it becomes the new normal. American allies will lose confidence in them, plus China will be emboldened. But if they do act, they risk an escalation. It could be the perfect excuse for China to attack Taiwan. That dilemma was evident in Lloyd Austin's speech. This is what he said. The People's Republic of China continues to conduct an alarming number of risky intercepts of U.S. and allied aircraft flying lawfully in international airspace. We've all just seen a, 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 another troubling case of aggressive and unprofessional flying by the PRC. So we will support our allies and partners as they defend themselves against coercion and bullying. To be clear, we do not seek conflict or confrontation. So that was the tone at Shangri-La. A lot of blaming, a lot of veiled threats, but zero efforts to find a solution. In fact, there was agreement on just one issue that war is a bad idea. China said a conflict with the U.S. would bring unbearable pain. And the U.S. said a war in Taiwan would be devastating. It is undeniable that a severe conflict or confrontation between China and the U.S. will be an unbearable pain for the world. You know, the whole world has a stake in maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. The whole world. The security of commercial shipping lanes and global supply chains depend on, depends on it. And so does freedom of navigation worldwide, worldwide. But make no mistake, conflict in the Taiwan Strait would be devastating. Well, no war is too low a bar. Most countries were hoping for talks between China and the U.S., but at Shangri-La, we saw the opposite. This is a relationship that is almost beyond saving. China seems to have realized that. The question is, will the U.S.?
because they're still hoping for engagement, still talking about de-risking from China. And all of that signals confusion. Washington needs to decide how it will deal with China. Do they see China as a competitor or a rival? And that definition will be key to the future of the Indo-Pacific. Of course, that doesn't mean ending all engagement. Talks are important to avoid miscalculations, to do the bare minimum. One such example is the Komodo naval drills in Indonesia. Around 49 countries are participating. Wait till you hear the list. The US, China, and Russia. Some of the biggest rivals are holding drills together. India and Pakistan, North and South Korea. Beyond the symbolism, such drills are key to keeping lines of communication open. Even today, Russia and the US have channels open. It's not about repairing relations, it's about preventing a further meltdown. But China clearly is not interested in that. So the US needs to take a call. Do they keep ignoring such near collisions and maneuvers or do they take a harsher stance? Have you heard of the phrase living in a bubble? It is used to describe someone who is isolated, disconnected from reality, someone who lives in an echo chamber. It can be used to describe the Chinese state too. They live in a bubble, fed with a daily dose of Communist Party propaganda. It's bad enough as it is, but it's dangerous when you start buying your own propaganda. Let me give you a recent example. Two Chinese experts, two Chinese officials, have given an assessment on India. They say India is no challenge for the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese Army. And this is not jingoistic bombast. This is their ignorance speaking. The men who made these statements are Zhao Xiao Zhu and Zhang Qi. Both hold the position of what they call senior colonel in the Chinese military. They're members of what you can call the PLA's brain trust. They work with China's leading military universities. So what they think shapes the strategy of the Chinese army. And that's why their opinion matters. Last week, the PLA sent these officials to the Shangri-La Dialogue. This is an annual security conference. It is hosted by Singapore, and it's attended by leading defense leaders and thinkers. So these PLA officials were there, and they spoke about India and the border standoff with China. I have their statements. Senior Colonel Zhao spoke about India's defense modernization. Listen to what he said. India is unlikely to catch up to China in the coming decades because of its weak industrial infrastructure, while China has built complex and systematic defense industrial platforms. And this is what his counterpart had to say. Senior Colonel Zhang, I'm quoting again, India has spared no effort in military modernization in a bid to become an impressive superpower as other countries have done. This was their opinion. They say India is lagging in defense manufacturing and hence poses no challenge to China. If this is the foundation of the PLA's military strategy, I say it's good news for India because it just demonstrates their ignorance. You see, there's a limited connection between military modernization and war preparedness. Modernization is about enhancing your country's military capabilities. It is important, yes, but only to an extent. Being ready for war involves a lot more than just having the latest and the greatest weapons. You need many other things to fight a war, like infrastructure, strategy, training, knowing the lay of the land, understanding the weakness of your adversary, and the experience of fighting and winning wars. We know that China is woefully inadequate in this department. China hasn't fought a war in more than four decades, so while the PLA's military may be growing, its soldiers remain untested. Most of China's military arsenal has not seen any real combat. The ability of their soldiers to use their weapons is unproven. Compare that to India. Our soldiers are in better shape, they know their weapons well, and they have combat experience. Do you know what else you need to fight a war? You need a robust economy. Now, China's economy is much bigger than India, no two ways about it. But at this point, it's too fragile to handle a war. Remember what I said about living in a bubble and buying your own propaganda? Chinese strategists are doing that. Their country is struggling with a deep debt crisis. Local governments are sinking, they owe large amounts of money, and they're running out of cash. We've been telling you about this. Last month, there was a serious crisis in Kunming. Reports said a local authority was on the verge of bankruptcy. They had to, to repay $170 million, but they did not have that money. So at the 11th hour, Authorities issued new bonds. They were trying to raise more cash. And when these reports came out, local officials were quick to deny them. But one city after another is coming under stress. In Wuhan, 
They've started naming and shaming debtors. They've released hundreds of names to recover a sum of $42 million. Going by one estimate, local governments in China owe about $23 trillion. That's nearly twice the size of China's GDP. I'll repeat that. China's GDP is a little over $12 trillion. Local government debt is at a whopping $23 trillion. Can a country like this finance a war? And at what cost? Perhaps China's military thinkers should think about this. And here's what India should think about. The threat from China is real and it's not going away. The PLA may or may not have the appetite for war, but they're certainly in no hurry to end the border standoff with India. So New Delhi must be prepared for all eventualities. The problem is the war in Ukraine. It is hurting India's preparedness. Supplies from Russia have not been steady and now reports say Russia is buying back parts of weapons. It is repurchasing tanks and missiles that it exported earlier. A new report was published today. It talks about Russian buybacks. It says Russia is re-importing some military components, mostly parts for tanks and missiles. And what does Moscow plan to do with these? Install them in older weapons and deploy those weapons for the war in Ukraine. Next question. Where is Russia getting these parts from? India and Myanmar, according to reports. Both countries rely heavily on Russian military supplies, and now Russia is relying on them to upgrade its old weapons. There is customs data that refers to some shipments. Two Russian manufacturers have been named. Ural Wagon Zavod and Russian NPK KBM. These are Russian companies. Apparently, they're buying back parts from India and Myanmar. Now, it is possible that these parts were defective and are being returned. It's possible that they will be replaced. But going by one claim, there were no records of these items being replaced, not until March 2023. So most likely, Russia is just keeping them for now. And it makes sense. Such parts are hard to come by for two reasons mainly. One, the war is exhausting Russia's stocks. And two, Western sanctions have hit Russia's manufacturing capabilities. Companies cannot find the components they need. So they're looking for alternatives. Even breaking down civilian equipment like planes to cannibalize spare parts. So the plan to re-import parts makes sense. Russia's defense industry is under stress and it has a bearing on countries that depend on Russia. Which brings us to India. Defense deliveries to India have been running late. In March, the Indian Air Force made a statement. It said, Russia is unable to deliver vital supplies. The Air Force said this to Indian lawmakers. There was a major delivery planned for this year, but the Air Force said it won't happen. It won't happen this year. Now, we don't have the specifics, but most experts agree that this is about the S-400 missile defense system. India has bought five of these from Russia. Three of the systems have been delivered. Two are awaited. And the IAF statement was telling. It was the first public admission of a shortfall from the Russian side. In the month of March, another report emerged. It said India would now get the pending deliveries by early 2024. Such delays tend to test the relationship. There are outstanding issues like payment for Russian supplies. Moscow recently complained about this. It said it has billions of rupees in Indian banks and nowhere to use them. Let me explain this. India and Russia have a trade mechanism in place, the rupee-ruble system. That is the mechanism. It is used to bypass the US dollar and Western sanctions. You see, Russia has been cut off from the global banking system. So India uses the rupee to buy Russian goods, goods like oil and weapons. This money goes into an Indian bank account in Russia. Similarly, when Russia buys something from India, it pays in the ruble. The problem is that Russia doesn't buy very much from India. So there's a gap. It gets close to 1 billion Indian rupees every month, according to one estimate. And every quarter, this pile grows by 2 to 3 billion rupees. But since Moscow is not buying very much from India, it doesn't have a way to spend this cash. The same thing will happen when India gets Russian weapons. The same payment mechanism will be used. India will pay for those weapons in rupees. And Russia will not be able to use those rupees. As both sides try to resolve this, India is also reducing its dependence on Russia. Earlier, 62% of India's defense imports came from Russia. Now this number has dropped to just 45%. India has now shifted to other suppliers, countries like France, which now accounts for 29% of India's defense imports, and the US, which accounts for 11%. And this diversification is a good strategy because India cannot put all its eggs in the Russian basket. 
Moscow's war should not be allowed to compromise India's war preparedness. Everyone loves a good surprise, maybe a nice birthday party or a gift. But surprises are best left to our personal lives. In geopolitics, the premium is on stability and predictability. Boring, but necessary. But Saudi Arabia missed the memo. This weekend, the kingdom decided to slash oil output. They will produce one million fewer barrels in July. But that's not the full story. Saudi Arabia is going solo here. The oil cartel, OPEC+, Plus, has stuck to its previous cuts. They're not increasing cuts. Only Saudi Arabia has announced new cuts. Listen in to their energy minister. As we have done in April, whereby uh, the countries that had uh, agreed to uh, do the voluntary cuts uh, have extended that voluntary cuts to end of 24. And uh, I would have to call it the Saudi lollipop which is a million barrel of reduction uh, for the start that starts at the 1st of July. And it, that million is also extendable. Interesting choice of words. Oil is arguably the most important commodity of our times. Dropping surprise bombs in that market is certainly not a Saudi lollipop, as he puts it. So why is Riyadh doing it? To proper prices. In the months after Russia's invasion, oil was booming. Let's look at Brent crude. It's an oil index. In June 2022, Brent crude was $112. That's $112 per barrel. And now, $76 per barrel. It had fallen to nearly $70 by late May. Now, that's bad news for the Saudi kingdom. Around 50% of their economy is built on oil. So what did they do? They reduce oil production to boost prices. It's Economics 101. There are two ways to increase prices. You either boost the demand or you reduce the supply. Saudi Arabia went for the latter. They reduce the supply. They need higher prices to fund their grand diversification plans. But how high? The International Monetary Fund says $80 per barrel. That's what they need. At that price, Riyadh will be comfortable. But why isn't that happening? Why is that, that rise not happening organically? Because the global economy is not growing fast enough. Look at any industry. Travel has not reached pre-pandemic levels. Neither has factory output. So the demand for oil continues to be stagnant. Prices are not racing towards $100 a barrel. They're falling towards 70 Hence the surprise announcement by Saudi Arabia. But there's a flip side to it. Higher oil prices can fuel inflation. That's what happened in 2022. Central banks have been raising interest rates to keep prices under control. They were just about to hit the pause button. But if oil rallies again, all bets are off. So what scenarios are we looking at? The most optimistic one is this. There is a grand economic recovery in the second half of this year. Factory production rises, people start flying again, so the demand for oil rises organically. That would bring stability to the market. If not, there could be trouble. Rising oil prices will worsen the cost of living crisis. How is India placed to tackle this problem? Well, there is some good news. We're not as dependent on Saudi Arabia. Around 40% of India's oil, oil imports, now come from Russia. That's more than Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Iraq combined. And since Russia has not announced any cuts yet, the impact on India will be limited. Having said that, it's not all rosy. 85% of India's oil is imported. New Delhi is ultimately at OPEC's mercy like all non-oil producers. It's a major drawback of the global system, one so-called lollipop, and you pay extra at the pump. Speaking of high prices, let's turn our attention to the UK, the sick man of Europe. While inflation has been falling everywhere else, it remains stubbornly high in the UK. It is going down, but not fast enough. Of particular concern is food inflation. Food prices are about 20% higher than they were last year. This keeps aggravating their cost of living crisis and their government still doesn't know how to address it. Last week, they were looking into putting price caps at supermarkets. Indians are familiar with the concept, the concept of a maximum retail price. But that isn't standard practice in the UK and unsurprisingly, some companies are not willing to implement it. How will they price gouge if there's a cap? 
This is a standoff in the making between the government and supermarkets. And now a new idea has been floated, a universal basic income. Our next report has more. What would you do if you were assured about $2,000 a month? Guaranteed that amount in your bank account. You may not have to worry about making ends meet. If that stress melted away, would you focus on your career more? Or would you stop working and take it easy? That's what the UK is trying to find out. A think tank called Autonomy is looking to conduct a pilot program. A pilot for universal basic income. It plans to test it out on 30 people in two areas in England. It wants to study how these people behave. The think tank hopes that the findings will pave the way to introduce universal basic income in the UK. Because, let's face it, the UK might need this. The country is suffering. Suffering at the hands of inflation. More than almost anywhere else in Europe. Every country was hit by a cost of living crisis when the war in Ukraine erupted last year. But no one seems to be dealing with it worse than the UK. Inflation hit a 40-year high of 11.1% last October. It has climbed down now, but not enough. The latest figures show inflation at 8.7% in April. It was slightly more than expected, but that's not the biggest problem. It's what's driving inflation that's worrying policymakers in Rishi Sunak's government. Food inflation. Whilst it is welcome that the headline rate of inflation has fallen, these numbers show there is absolutely no room for complacency in the battle against inflation. Uh, food price inflation is still worryingly high. That's why we've had food producers in farmers in supermarkets in to talk about what we can do to reduce the pressure there. Food and non-alcoholic beverage prices rose by 19.1% year on year in April almost 20% for essentials like bread, milk and eggs. You can see why it has the British government worried. How long can people keep paying 20% extra for these basics? Or continue to deal with general inflation over 8%? It's currently running between 8.7 and 10%. What we've also had because of the war in Ukraine is vast increase in energy costs and also food costs in the UK have to, bills have increased between 16 and 20% in the last 12 months. So everybody's feeling the strain, regardless of the level of income that they've got. The Sunak administration is scrambling to bring food inflation in check. Their solution? Introduce price caps at supermarkets. The government floated this idea last week, and it immediately faced a backlash from major supermarket chains. Even though the price caps would be voluntary, the supermarket tycoons aren't having it. The British Retail Consortium put out a message they said that the government should not focus on recreating 70s style price controls. They should work on cutting red tape instead. Of course, the supermarkets would prefer the loosening of government regulations, but they're just the latest to rebel against the government. For months, the officials at 10 Downing Street have faced stiff resistance. Railway workers, nurses, paramedics, everyone has been taken to the streets. Everyone wants a pay rise to deal with the crippling cost of living. Sunak's government doesn't think this is feasible. They say it'll cost too much, empty the treasury. So it's been pushing back against striking workers. Downing Street even wants to enact a new law to undermine the right to strike. That's how much it's against increasing wages. In this scenario, it seems impossible that the government would agree to universal basic income, no matter what the findings are. But the think tank proposing the radical solution may not have to worry much. The study will be over around the next general election. And the way things stand at the moment, this government's inability to handle inflation may lead to their ouster. Now let's turn our attention to Afghanistan. Almost 80 schoolgirls, 8-0, 80 schoolgirls there have been poisoned. This happened over the weekend in the Sarepol province in northern Afghanistan. Two schools were targeted. 60 girls were poisoned in the first school, 17 in the second. The girls were primary school students from classes 1 to 6. The authorities claim that all these girls were rushed to hospital and that they're all fine now. But very few details have been given. No confirmation about the poison use, no word on how the attackers managed to poison these girls, no details about the injuries that the girls have sustained. And it's only girls.
The authorities just said that they are now in quote-unquote good condition. We do hope they are. But what's happened is alarming. Who is targeting Afghan schoolgirls? The authorities say this is a case of a personal grudge and that the suspect allegedly paid a third party to carry out these attacks. This is an initial report based on the investigation by the Provincial Education Department. And this is all that they're willing to share for the moment. The department officials have not been too forthcoming. This is not the first time or the first incident of poisoning in Afghanistan, but this is the first since the Taliban took power in 2021. In the last two years, they have systematically attacked women's education. They're not allowed to study or work. Education for girls is allowed only up to the age of 12. After that, they're barred from school and college. And after what happened over the weekend, it seems even children are not safe in schools. School poisonings are a preferred modus operandi of hardliners. Look at neighboring Iran. It has become a regular occurrence in Iran. The first reports came last November. School girls were poisoned in the city of Qom. It's a holy city and it made news for all the wrong reasons. Since then, more than 1,000 Iranian school girls have been poisoned. None of the children reportedly died, but that may not have been the intention. Let me quote from the UN Human Rights Office report in March. This is what it says. Many parents have removed their daughters from school for fear of these attacks. The United States also weighed in on the matter. This is what they said. Women and girls everywhere have a fundamental right to education. Time and time again, it has been demonstrated that when women and girls receive an education and are able to contribute to their economies, it benefits society as a whole. So the possibility that girls in Iran are being possibly poisoned simply for trying to get an education is, uh, is, is shameful and it's uh, unacceptable. And uh, our thoughts remain with the victims of, of, and their families. Both seem to imply that the attacks were about one thing, stopping girls from receiving an education. But since then, the world seems to have moved on. And the school girls keep facing attacks. The poisonings in Iran have not stopped completely. Reports keep popping up from time to time, which means that school girls keep getting pulled out of school. And now the trend has crossed the border and returned to Afghanistan. It seems like an insidious plot to stop the education of women, to relegate them to the background, and the world doesn't seem to care enough. Every time this kind of news comes out, there's a loud reaction, but no action. There are appeals to conduct a fair investigation, catch the people responsible. But where's the follow-up? Without concrete action, these attacks will continue. They'll also spread. Once people see that no one is stopping them, they will continue poisoning schoolgirls with impunity, and this has to stop. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Starting with India, an under construction bridge collapsed in the state of Bihar. This particular bridge collapsed for the second time in 14 months. In Indonesia, worshippers climbed to the top of an active volcano to perform a religious ceremony. And June is the Pride Month. In Thailand, members of the LGBTQ community held a pride parade in Bangkok. And finally, what makes the 5th of June significant? We're taking you back in history. On this day in 1967, a six-day war began in West Asia. This war was fought between Israel and Arab states, the states of Egypt, Jordan and Syria. The brief but bloody battle was a result of years of diplomatic friction. The war ended with a UN-brokered ceasefire, but it changed the map of West Asia. Leaving you with that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
email exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colonist.